Thank you, Lord. You are good. Yes, we will. Yes, we will. So glad to be back with everybody today. I was gone at a wedding, a fantastic wedding. It was a wonderful day, but I'll tell you what, I missed you guys. I missed being here. I thought a lot about what we're doing. So as you guys get in your, your tribes, I want you to think about three words. Oh, by the way, God is good. Let me start that again. God is good. Man, I'm so fired up today, and I want to talk to you guys a little bit about OCC, Operation, Operation Christmas Child. I know Mrs. Whelan's going to come up right after worship, but if you guys would give me your attention, that's important. We have our goal at 500 boxes. That's our goal. Clap it up for that goal. 500 boxes. Yes. Yes, all authority has been given to the Lord in heaven and earth to go out and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, making disciples of all the nations. Let me say it again. Making disciples of all the nations. This morning on the announcements, we heard the theme for this week is Mission Unstoppable. And I know you guys are excited to understand what that means. What that means is that Jesus Christ has all authority. He's building his church. He's building his church. He's moving forward. We will prevail. Guys, we have a goal of 500 boxes. Right now, it doesn't look like we're on schedule, but I know and we know we are right on schedule. Therefore, team leaders, stand up. Team leaders, stand up. Yeah, clap it up for your team leaders. Come on, team leaders. Team leaders. Nick, how you doing? How many boxes does your team have? Team, Nick, give me a number. How many boxes? All right, Vossler. Hey. Wait, hey, heavy is the head, man. You're the leader. How many boxes do we have? Okay, give me an idea. We, we, hey, he's saying potentially seven. Clap it up, clap it up. Anna, what do you have? Well, how many boxes do you have? Huh? We have one box. You're right on schedule because you're Christian, but you're also American. All right, sit down, guys, sit down. You're Christian, but you're American. By the way, by the way today, as your leader, I want to put some pressure on you. Team leaders, students, look at me and stop talking. Hey, listen to me now. We are going to make our goal. We, Emmanuel, we, God's kingdom, we are going to make our goal. I was sitting this morning in the cafeteria, and one of your teachers showed up with 25 soccer balls. Come on! 25! Hey, look at me, young man. If you don't order your soccer ball today on Amazon, we're not going to have it. Young lady, if you don't get your dolls ordered today, we're not going to have it. We listen, Next Wednesday, you will be standing with your tribe in the gym, and you're going to be packing the boxes. Okay, next Wednesday during tribal time, you will be packing your boxes. I know that you guys plan on doing this, so I'm giving you the bell. Guess what? We're in the second half. It's time. It's time. I've asked students, they all said it. So I want you to think about this right now, team leaders. Team leaders, we need 10 boxes per team. Do you guys hear me? How many boxes per team do we need? Okay, team leaders, the name of the game is I'm expecting it from you. You're gonna turn around and talk to your team outside of this meeting. We have a goal to God be the glory 
Intentions are great, but guess what? Obedience is what the Lord calls for. We're going to get out there and we're going to make it happen. And right now we're going to go, right now we're going to go starting with Jaira, praise call, right into worship. But guys, does everyone hear what half is it? It's time to play. It's second half of the game. To God be the glory. Let's go. You ready? Here we go. Guys, that was not a winner. Hey, let me say it again. We're making our goal. Give us all your heart, all your mind, all your strength. Let me say it again. Show up to the game one more time. Let's go. Give it to us. Let's go. Yes. Thank you. Come on. Come on. Thank you, Lord. All right, I'd like to invite you guys up to the front.
Good morning, guys. It is very good to be here again today. You guys have been seeing me for the last two weeks. And next week is packing week. So today, I just want to tell you something. I've been reading um, a scripture, and the scripture said in uh, Luke 12, 48, to him, much is given, much will be demanded. And I'm going to tell you the story about Alex. Alex is a boy who lost everything. He was born in Rwanda, and he, did it. he lost his family. He lost his home. He lost everything he knew. His grandmother took care of him, but at one point, he also lost that. So he was put in an orphanage when he was six. Um, at, when he was seven years old, he was so excited, even though he lost a lot of things, he still had some joy in his, in his heart. So when he was seven, um, missionaries came with Operation Christmas Child Shoebox, and that shoebox gave him so much hope. He has joined a choir and he traveled to different parts of Africa singing. The seed was planted with a shoebox. And after a year, he made the decision to follow Christ. After that, he was adopted by a family in the United States. And in 2010, he was given the opportunity to go back to the same orphanage to hand the shoeboxes. And my question for you today is, when you go home, do any of you go home and don't have shoes, don't have clothes? Have any of you lost mom, dad, home? I'm sure the answer is no. You guys have been given so much. I think a lot of you even own a car, right? And when I was in high school, I didn't own a car. And it was okay because the reality in poor countries is like everything you have I would say most of the stuff you have is no a need, it's a luxury. To have brown shoes, to be part, to be of a Christian school is no a luxury, it's no a need, but it's a luxury that you guys have been given. And I want to encourage you with something. As I was praying this morning, I want to encourage you that do not take for granted what you have given, but use it for God's glory. I know Coach is so excited about this. And I am so excited. So this morning he said, do you have any doubt that we can do the 400 shoe boxes? Well, he said 500 shoe boxes. So I think he's just a little bit more excited, right? But the thing is, guys, I know most of the places that we're dropping the stuff is not full, right? We can be very discouraged. Us can be discouraged. But this is your thing. This is one day God is standing before you, and I don't know all your names, but he's going to ask you, why did you do what I gave you? Why did you do what I gave you? Did you share what you have with others? And guys, a shoebox only takes $30 at least to fill. So I just want to encourage you, let's make this happen. This is not for me. This is not even for the kids. This is for the Lord and for you to plant the seed of hope to Jesus, and uh, to all these children around the world. So I want you to go home today with this question. What I'm going to do with what God has given me? It's great to be here today. I remember when I was your age, and every weekend I would jam-pack my backpack with all of these books. I was going to get ahead for the next week of school academically. But Friday night, I didn't unzip my backpack. Saturday morning, I didn't unzip it. Saturday night, I didn't unzip it. Sunday night, I didn't unzip it. Oh, well, I'll just go to school as I am. How many of you are prepared academically? You've done all of your homework. I need audience participation. Shout it out. Boy. In, in, how many of you are totally prepared for that test today? You study. How many of you, in all honesty, are not prepared? Shout it out. <laughs> How many of you are missing that hour of sleep? Shout it out. Okay, Let me pray for us. Lord, I'm just so glad to be here today. Thank you for everyone that's here. Encourage them. Help them to prepare academically for their homework. 
their tests today. Lord, give them strength as all of us are missing that one hour of sleep. So we commit everything to Jesus. May the message be done with a demonstration of the Holy Spirit's power. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. How many of you here today, by show of hands, have read the book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? Okay, many of you have. They have all of C.S. Lewis's originals where I went to college at Wheaton. So if you're ever in Chicago, go to the C.S. Lewis Center at Wheaton. You'll see his typewriter, his original works, and they even have a wardrobe. And when you're in Chicago, make sure you also pick up a Chicago-style pizza. It's the food that we're going to be partaking of together in heaven. How many of you have had Chicago-style pizza before? Okay, a number of you. They put the sauce on the very top and the cheese underneath, and it is amazing. C.S. Lewis had a very vivid imagination as a child. He loved animals. He loved the tale of Peter Rabbit, and he imagined animals talking to each other, but he also had a lot of pain in his life. When he was 10 years old, his mother died. He was in the First World War with the British Army. He saw combat, and he was severely injured, and he couldn't get all of the bad images of war out of his mind. And the third area of pain in his life, even when he was wounded, his dad never once came to visit him in the hospital. He had a lot of pain in his life, and because of that pain, he said that it drove him to atheism. Because of that pain, his mother dying, being injured in the First World War, having terrible images of war, he couldn't get out of his mind. His father never came to visit him. He said it drove him to not believing in God. Well, he was very smart. He graduated from Oxford. He became a teacher, a professor at Oxford. And he was befriended by this Christian by the name of J.R.R. Tolkien, who wrote The Hobbit. And eventually, at the age of 33 years old, C.S. Lewis became a Christian. He called himself the most reluctant convert. He ended up writing children's books, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, one of those, and the classic book in the last 100 years, to give a defense and apologetic for Christianity called mere Christianity. Now, I believe that everyone here today can relate to some area of C.S. Lewis's life. Maybe you're saying, Pastor, I also have a very vivid imagination, or I love animals. Or maybe you'd say, Pastor, the only reason I'm here is because my parents or my grandparents insisted that I go here but all this stuff I'm being taught, I don't believe it for a second. I'm an atheist. I don't even believe that there is a God. Others of us would say, you know what? I have been befriended by a Christian. Some of us would say, I'm a very committed Christian. But I believe whatever you would say, in whatever area of his life that you can best relate to, maybe you're saying I can best relate to the pain of his life. Because I know what it's like to lose a family member. Or I know what it's like to go through all sorts of injuries and pain in my life. But no matter what part of his life you can best relate to, there's a question that everyone here needs to be prepared to answer. In fact, how you answer this question is going to determine whether you spend eternity with God in heaven or whether you spend a Christless eternity in hell. And the question is found in Matthew chapter 16. It's a very simple question, and yet how you answer this will have implications for all of eternity in your situation. The question is, who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? Jesus is asking that question of his disciples, but he's asking that question of everyone here today. And you may say, Pastor... How does that relate to my life? I am a straight-A student. I'm an outstanding athlete. All of those things are wonderful. But what matters most, the number one question you will have to ask and answer for your life, who do you say I am? Jesus is asking you that question. Now that question has been pondered and thought about, and when you think about it, there are only four possibilities. In fact, everyone here today 
is in one of these four categories. There is no other intellectual category outside of these four possibilities. Now, these four possibilities that I'm going to talk about in the next 12 minutes are not original to me, but rather to the writings of C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity and Josh McDowell in evidence that demands a verdict. So what is possibility number one? Jesus is asking you that question. Who do you say I am? You may say Jesus is a liar. Maybe some of you would say that. And I think about different politicians when I was growing up. Like President George Herbert Walker Book that looked the American people in the eye and said, read my lips, no more taxes. He raised taxes. Or President Clinton looked the American people in the eye and he lied. Politicians lie. God never lies. Numbers 23, 19 says this. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? In other words, God always, always, always keeps his promises. He always, always keeps his words. Think about this. This is mind-boggling to me for people that say Jesus is a liar. Some would say that. But think about Matthew chapter 22 when the religious leaders, his political opponents, even they admit about Jesus. What do they say? Teacher, we know you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. So even Jesus' religious and political opponents, they admitted he was a man that told the truth. Jesus says in the Greek, ego in me, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So you may say Jesus is a liar, but that wouldn't be true. Even his opponents said that he was a man of truth. Secondly, you may say Jesus is is a lunatic, that he was mentally crazy. And I think about the case that was made to go into the Iraq war, which I was a part of. The case was made, Saddam Hussein was a lunatic. He was mentally crazy. He gassed and killed his own people. You know what he did with his own family members and political opponents? If he disagreed with you as a political opponent or a family member, and he was intimidated by you, he would have you cut up and sent you back home to your family in a body bag. He set his own oil fields on fire. He was a madman. He was a lunatic. He was crazy. But contrast Saddam Hussein, a madman, a crazy man, a lunatic, with the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says about Jesus that he had compassion on the crowds because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Even the pain in your life today, Jesus cares about you. He knows what you're going through. Remember the Bible says about Jesus that he was a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. He was despised and rejected by men. So you may feel lonely today. Jesus knows what it's like to be lonely. He knows what it's like to feel rejected. That's why he says, come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So you could try to say Jesus is a lunatic, but I think of Mark chapter 12. Think about how you'd answer this question. The religious leaders came to Jesus with a question. Teacher, is it right in Mark chapter 12 to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And Jesus says, show me a denarius. They bring this small coin to him, and he says to them, whose portrait? whose inscription is on this. They say Caesar's. He says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. That doesn't sound like a madman, a crazy man, a lunatic. It is the mind of a brilliant man, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Son of Man. So you may say Jesus is a lunatic, but that would be crazy. Thirdly, you may say Jesus was a legend. I've been to Paul Bunyan land in Minnesota. Paul Bunyan was a legend. It was said that he fought a grizzly bear. It was said that he formed the Great Lakes. It was said that when he dropped his axe, it formed the Grand Canyon. But it's simply that, a legend. Jesus Christ is no legend. All four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Even outside of the Bible. 
Josephus, the Jewish historian, wrote about Jesus. Now think about this. If Jesus was a legend, why would 10 of the 12 disciples lose their life and become martyrs for a legend, for a fairy tale? It makes no sense. Why would you travel over land and sea for a fairy tale, for a legend? It doesn't make any sense. Knowing that when you talk about the resurrection of Christ, you lose your life. I think of my friend Hytham Hadar. For many years in charge of Operation Christmas Child in northern Africa and Arab countries, he said this, how would you respond? A Muslim fundamentalist came up to a professing Christian. Many of you here today are professing Christians. This is what the Muslim fundamentalist said. They put a gun to the Christian's head, deny knowing Jesus Christ, deny that he's the son of God, we'll let you live. He would not deny Jesus Christ. The Muslim fundamentalist blew his brains out. Now, why would you stand strong for Christ, knowing you'd use your life for a fairy tale or a legend, even today? As you're gathered here, there are millions of Christians around the world that are being persecuted for their faith, thrown into prison, and killed. Why would they do that if Jesus was simply a legend? It makes no sense. So... You may say Jesus is a legend, but that wouldn't be true. Or finally, you may say Jesus is Lord. That's the fourth and final possibility. And I think about Thomas. Thomas was a doubter. Don't be a doubting Thomas. But Thomas says, after he sees the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ, he says, my Lord and my God. Or this is implications for everyone here, for the entire world. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. A few verses later, for whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved, period. Or how about the words of Peter? He saw the resurrected Christ, and Peter says what? And it's a challenge to every Christian. But in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. You know what Jesus said of himself? I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Only in Jesus Christ is there purpose and meaning and direction in life. And all over the world, there are people your age that are trying to find meaning and purpose and direction and satisfaction in life. They'll try that in relationships. But eventually it comes up empty. Or they'll try that in sexual relationships, but eventually that comes up empty. Or they'll try that in the context of earning all this money. Or they'll try to find happiness in the context of the pursuit of sports. But eventually it comes up empty. No, Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. The common factor I know about every audience I ever speak, whether it's in the Iraq war, or the Florida State Prison System, everyone is ultimately looking for Jesus. Because only in Jesus Christ is there a friend that will never abandon you, never divorce you, never betray you, never cancel you. Only in Jesus is there a friend. Only in Jesus is there fulfillment in life. Only in Jesus is there forgiveness of sin. Only in Jesus is there a future home in heaven. Augustine, the brilliant theologian and philosopher, said this. Our hearts are restless until they find their rest in Christ. That's the common factor. You may have the wealthiest family members, the wealthiest friends. You may even know some professional athletes. But I'm here to say everyone is ultimately looking for Jesus. In fact, Blaise Pascal, the great mathematician, said this. God has placed within everyone a Christ-sized vacuum that only Christ can fill. Only Christ can can bring you meaning and purpose and direction and satisfaction and salvation in life. Now, maybe you're saying, well, Pastor, I don't agree with anything you're saying. Again, the only reason I'm here is because I'm forced to be here. I did not want to be here. I don't believe anything you're saying. I don't believe what your teachers are saying. What I would share with you is the argumentation of Blaise Pascal, the brilliant mathematician, philosopher, theologian, and Christian. This is what he said. Think of how you'd interact with this. 
What if I'm wrong? What have I lost as a Christian? On the other hand, using Pascal's wager, what if I'm right? What if all the things your teachers are saying to you is right? Jesus is the only way of salvation, and we must confess him as our Lord and Savior. What if we're right? And I know that we are. But what has the unbeliever lost? Those that never asked Jesus to be their Lord and Savior. They're going to spend a Christless eternity in hell. Paul says today is the day of salvation. So today I title the message, Who do you say I am? There are only four possibilities. First, you may say Jesus is a liar. That wouldn't be true. Secondly, you may say Jesus is a lunatic. Well, that's craziness when you look at his life. Thirdly, you may say that Jesus is a legend. But why would millions of Christians around the world even today be willing to be put to death and thrown into prison for a fairy tale or a legend that doesn't make any sense? Or finally, you may say that Jesus is Lord. That's what C.S. Lewis did. He had a lot of pain in his life. His mother dying. Getting war images out of his mind, being injured in combat, and his father rejecting him, never coming to visit him. It said it drove him to atheism. He didn't believe in God until he met that Christian, J.R.R. Tolkien, that befriended him. And finally, at the age of 33, C.S. Lewis became the most reluctant convert. He converted to Christ. He asked Jesus Christ to be his Lord and Savior. Now maybe you're saying, well, how come I haven't heard a whole lot about his life, the end of his life? Well, he died on the same day that President John F. Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas. November of 1963. I wasn't even born yet, but I went to seminary in Dallas and I went to the grassy knoll. You know what mattered on that day for C.S. Lewis? Dying in November of 1963? And the same principle that mattered for President John F. Kennedy that died on the same day in November of 1963. Not how much money, fame, or power do you have. Who do you say I am? And C.S. Lewis said, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. We never know when we're going to die. I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond. Just like I did years ago, preaching to the soldiers in the American army during the war in Iraq. So I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call out your name. I'm not going to embarrass you, but with all eyes closed and heads bowed. Maybe you're saying, Pastor, I've never come to that place in my life. I've admitted that I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sin. Only his shed blood washes away my sin. I've never called on Jesus for salvation. I've never decided to follow him as my Lord and Savior. But today, I want to call on Jesus for salvation, asking him to be my Lord and Savior. I've never done that before, but today, I choose to call on Jesus Christ to be my Lord and Savior. I will not embarrass you, but if that's you, would you slip up your hand? privacy of your heart and privacy of your seat, I want to encourage you to pray this to the Lord Jesus Christ. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, please forgive me for all of my sin. Thank you that you died on the cross for me. Lord Jesus Christ, save me. Come into my heart as my Lord and Savior. Help me to live for you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And with all eyes open, I want to encourage you, if you prayed that, that's one prayer. Jesus always answers immediately. If you call on him today, tell your friends, tell your teachers, thank you for coming, you're dismissed.